Hello and welcome to Design Education Talk from the New Art School. Our guest today is Mitch Goldstein. Welcome, Mitch. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. It's wonderful to have you here. So tell us about you and your work. Um, sure. So I am a currently an associate professor at Rochester Institute of Technology, which is in, in sort of Western New York. Uh, a lot of people from around the country think I'm in New York City. I'm not even remotely near New York City. I'm like a five and a half hour drive away. And I teach a variety of stuff. My my education is mostly in graphic design, but I've also just completed at RIT a master's degree in furniture design. So I'm starting to kind of do a whole bunch of different stuff. So this fall, I usually teach a lot of foundation classes. And so this fall, I'm actually teaching 3D foundations, which is the first time I've done that. So that should be really interesting. I'm excited about that. I also wrote a book called How to Be a Design Student and How to Teach Them. Um, I have what I'm hoping is a pretty serious art practice. I'm trying to make that happen. Um, I actually have a uh, exhibition, a, a show with a friend of mine coming up in the fall that I'm pretty much just all summer is going to be making work for that. Um, and yeah, I just, I don't do good being not busy. So I like, yeah. like, I don't like summers. Like, like I summer, I'm going to be moving. Like I like cranking. So for me, summers are like, I got to have a plan. Like, like the idea of just like sitting on a beach is a nightmare for me. Like I can't do that. I've, I've got to have stuff to do. So yeah, I guess I, I just, I, I kind of dip my hands in as many things as I can, I guess. Fantastic. So what is, what is the latest, latest project you're working on? Um, so currently I have my friend, uh, Becca Aloisio and I, who I teach with, we've been friends for about 10 years, both at RIT. We have a um, big um, exhibition, a big gallery show, you know, an art show at RIT has a downtown city space called City Art Space. It's like a big gallery right in the middle of downtown. And we are the sort of fall show. We are like the opening show for the next sort of academic year. Um, it also coincides with um, Rochester Fringe Fest, which is like, you know, a kind of a culture and arts festival. And so this summer is pretty much in the studio making art. Like that's basically, I mean, I can't do it 24 seven, but I'm doing it extremely often as best I can. Um, so that's really what I'm dialed in. Like that's my, that's pretty much now until middle of August. What will you be showing? That's a really good question. I will let you know middle of August. Okay. Um, so it's, it's uh, my work. It's kind of, um, I'm, I'm still sort of, it's kind of an ongoing process, right? Figuring out what the work is about. But for me, visually what it looks like is mostly sort of sculptural collage. So I'm doing some really, really big pieces. I've got a piece I just finished that's like six feet by eight feet. Um, some other pieces that are slightly smaller. I've also got some very small sort of paper collages I've been working on. I post those online a lot. So it's kind of sitting in that. I think a lot of people would look at it and think it looks collage -y, but it's really more about sort of looking at a Berman collision and things like that. And it, it's sort of extending from my furniture thesis work which was a lot about um, sort of pathways through chaos and sort of things like that. So I think my work tends to be, it's kind of very fragmenty and very angly. And um, I personally think it's kind of messy, but artists who are really artists are like, you're the most uptight person I've ever met. So this is not even vaguely, you know, loose or anything like that. And so that's always kind of a, kind of a conversation in the head, like what's the work really trying to do? So I'll, I'll kind of let you know, you know, I, I've kind of figured out, I don't know. I've kind of figured out I don't sort of need to know necessarily. Like not knowing is kind of more fun for me versus having a very specific sort of goal. Um, so it's really just the, the act of making more than anything else. Absolutely. I mean, if you're approaching art from graphics, it's there. There is. There is. A, yeah, I sit in this weird spot in in you know, and I've always kind of sat in this weird space between you know, quote design and quote art, and and I've always said I don't. Those words don't mean anything to me, so I don't make a whole bunch of differentiations there. Um, but yeah, I'm just doing kind of my thing, which I know is like not a real answer, but that's kind of, I'm just doing what I do and, and it will or will not be interesting to other people. <laughs> like I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> I mean, you've been a great advocate for art and design education. I've read your book and I've been of course reading your tweets for many years. So tell us the story of how you got into teaching. Um, so that's a really funny question. So, so I mean, I'll, I'll try to make a long story slightly shorter. I'll make it as long as you like. Okay. I mean, my, initially I started out when I was in high school. Um, so I'm in the United States, right? So we go to college and, you know, when you're 18, typically. So when I graduated high school, um, I originally went to Syracuse University, um, also in upstate New York for architecture. And I, I made it through about four years, um, two of which I was paying attention and two of which I was wasting my parents' money, mostly. Um, and so... 
eventually they invited me to leave. That's how I like to put it. I don't want to say I was kicked out. We just decided it would be best if I wasn't there anymore. Um, and so I sort of left there in the mid nineties and kind of just did a bunch of retail jobs, really nothing interesting, just kind of making a paycheck and scraping by, um, did a little bit of fine art. I've always been sort of creative and artistic like that. Um, but never had a really serious practice. Um, eventually got into sort of some web design. Um, this is in like the late nineties when that was starting to kick off. And I kind of was hitting sort of a creative ceiling. Like I wasn't getting above a kind of minimum level of interestingness with the work I was doing. And that wasn't anybody's fault but my own. And um, my dad and I had a chat one day. He's like, you should go back to school. And I'm like, don't be a smart guy. Like, how am I going to pull? I couldn't pull it off once. How am I going to pull it off again? And we really talked about it. And I ended up applying and getting into Rhode Island School of Design, um, which is, you know, as most people know, one of the best art schools based on the planet. And that was a huge shock beyond unexpected. Like I didn't, I thought it was just a total waste of my time to even apply. Um, and that really changed my entire life. Like that was, you know, college is college and I understand that it is insanely expensive. And for some people, it's not something they really need. Like desperately, desperately needed it. I really needed it. And I went in there when I was, I think I started when I was 31 as an undergrad. And because I had all this life experience of kind of not doing a whole lot that was particularly interesting other than just sort of surviving. Um, I really grabbed it and I really went to town there and I had an amazing experience and I, I it, it really shaped who I am. And I, and I know that was like me, like I work my butt off, but I really do credit that experience with a lot of it. It really helped me form the version of Mitch that I've always kind of wanted to be. Um, and so while I was at RISD, I, one of my teachers, this guy, Mark Milhoff, this great teacher who still teaches there, um, he was like, you know, if you want to be a teaching assistant for one of my classes, like, go for it. And I'm like, ha, 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 that's very funny. Like, I don't know what I'm talking about. He's like, no, seriously. And I did it. And like on day two, I was like, this is amazing. Like, like you get paid to do Like, this is a job. You get to do this for a living. Like, it's incredible. And that was when I, ne it was never even occurred to me that that would be something I would be interested in. And it just like instantaneously clicked for me. It, 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 and not even that specific experience, but the idea of being an educator and and really, I was a teaching assistant for every single semester at RISD. And then after I graduated, I you know I actually got to teach a class or two at RISD, which was pretty incredible. Um, and eventually decided to go for a master's degree because at least in the United States, a master's degree is near or less necessary to be a full time educator. You know, to be a tenured or a tenure track educator. And um, I eventually landed at RIT, and and it's been incredible. And it's it's. It's the best job in the world. I, I, I know people say I'm not, I, I mean that in a very literal, real way. It is the best job in the world. I, I, I If somebody said, what happens if you hit the lottery? I'm like, I drive a nicer car to campus to teach. Like, I'm not stopping. Like, this is what I'm going to do. Like, this is what I do. And so it just represents such, and you know, you know this, and it represents such an amazing combination of sort of um, mentorship, but also being sort of creatively stimulated all the time. And then, you know, I have my own practice, which I sort of bring into the classroom to some extent. And so it's a lot of like that kind of dialogue happens. Students are making work. Um, the past year I've gotten to co-teach where we're trying this experiment at school where we're doing these really giant foundations classes. So in the, in the fall and spring, I taught with two other faculty, 75 students at one time in one big room yeah. um, for foundations, which has been super interesting. And so for me, it's just this infinitely stimulating thing that I happen to get paid to do in, in, a, in a way, you know, and again, I'm not ever going to be wealthy, but, but comfortably. And, and it's, it's just amazing. And, and I'm so glad I found it. Like I was really pretty much like, all right, I'm just going to be that guy kind of floating job to job, you know, retail, whatever, kind of scraping by. And I got this career, which is truly I don't know. I'm so past thankful. Like, like it sounds really silly to say it like that, but I'm beyond just thankful. It's really just, it's what I was always meant to do, I think. Um, and I get to do it. Like when people say, what's your dream job? I'm like, I'm living my, like I, I have it, you know, and it's amazing. Wonderful. Yep. So how do you see, um, I mean, the future of employment for students? This is, this is, this is a very tricky time for this. Uh, and students are, are, I think, more worried than ever. Of course, um, it seems. And I'll tell you, when I graduated from you know RISD in 2006, I was worried. Like everybody is worried all the time. It's an it's an ongoing thing. Um, I think that 
the obviously the dialogue right now is a lot around AI and generative content and things like that and sort of the devaluation of designers. But, you know, they said that cameras were going to devalue painters in the 1850s or whatever it was. You know, it's kind of an endless loop of like, mm -hmm. oh, my God, what is this thing? Holy crap. Okay. Like we figured it out. And so I, I really don't have a good answer because, you know, people say, how do I get a job? And I'm like, look, I have some basic ideas, but like I haven't looked for work in 10 years. Like I'm not the person you should be getting like job advice from, you know, but I think that what becomes more and more important is less the outcome and like the deliverable object and the sort of thing you're handing off to the client and more about how you get to it. And I really do think that while there's obviously a client is essentially buying a brand or a logo or a whatever, they're really buying your process. They're buying how you think about the, the project or the prompt. They're buying your way of translating sort of an abstract verbal idea or, or a desire or, or a market into a visual thing. And so can AI generate that? Absolutely. It can absolutely generate stuff, but it's not generating process. It's just sort of mosh pitting other stuff together into an outcome that is really, it's it's disingenuous at best. Sometimes it's toxic and vile. And so again, I don't really know how this is all going to shake out. I suspect in 15 years, AI will just be a pencil. It's just going to be a very complicated pencil. It's no different than any other tool. But right now people are freaking out and and I get it. I, I very much understand why they are. Yeah. I mean, it, it, especially in a world where it seems that a certain number of clients just want to get the job done. They're, they're not interested about the special process. Correct. That's, that, that, that's, that's what I find, you know, as a designer mm -hmm. on the flip side, is that you have an increasing number of people who just don't understand how this process can really help right. their industry. And no matter how much you try to educate a client sometimes, um, they're just looking for, some, for something to, 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 to fill a gap. Exactly. And I, I honestly, I know this sounds really silly to say it like this, but I think that's okay. Like, I don't think that's a problem. I think there are the kind of, what I've always said to my, my students and, and other colleagues is, you know, the, the, the client who is going to go to Fiverr and get a $20 logo, they're never going to pay of a for real work, ever. It's it's not, they're not in competition with Fiverr. Like, you're just, you're not competing with Fiverr. You're I not. mean, yeah, I mean, there, there are levels, of course. <laughs> There's levels, you know. And so I think that that ultimately, you know, a designer, I mean, again, I have worked as a designer very little recently, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But like my my, the way I approach design is basically it's a translation, and so I think that you know a designer translates sort of abstract things into visual form, right? Um, and so AI doesn't do that. You know, AI mushes stuff together, and so I think that where our value or where designers' value will start bubbling up is in that process. Now, again. Somebody who's gonna who has twenty five dollars for a logo isn't going to be invested in that process, and I don't think that's a problem. I think that is absolutely fine. They don't need a designer; they can just go to AI and say, "Generate me a you know a logo for my my hair my you know my hair salon." That's I don't think that's illegitimate. So it's kind of like about levels of integrity, you know, and levels of sort of involvement here as a designer. I mean, that's really the question that we got to kind of figure out. It it reminds me of a story when I was. Um... A young designer, uh, I was in Athens and I go to this cafe that has very, very expensive. It was by the sea in Piraeus. Mm -hmm. And they had spent you know, all the, like tens of thousands of, of euros, of dollars on the glass, uh, swinging glass door, yeah. the lights, it was the tables, it was the, um, you know, the decor in general. And then the menu, <laughs> I, was, I was with a friend, we were you know, both in the same and I look at the menu, and it was like, oh, my God. Yep. And the, the, the guy who so-called so designed it had his, had his mobile on, on the menu, which is you know, yes. like an emergency <laughs> like hotline. Right. And he, and he uh, so I called him up and said, look, I have a cafe, and I'm just, this is a very interesting menu. Of course, it was dreadful, but how much do you charge for? You know? right. And he quoted this, this, this like, didn't say like, like $50. So, so business is that, uh, pay tens of thousands of dollars, what I'm saying. And it's very, it's very common for other things, leave design to the last, the last minute, or they don't pay for any design. And they think that that Fiverr logo or that $50 logo or whatever is going to do, you know, and it's actually doing them much more damage. So that, well, that's what the problem is. Everybody needs a designer. Yeah. But they need to, to value what we're doing. Right. Uh, and I think, you know, we exist in a design environment, right? Like every human 
existence is inside of a designed reality. And so the idea of a designer, ultimately, you know, businesses, I mean, again, broadly speaking, businesses exist to make a profit, right? So I think really where design comes in and, and the thing that is so hard to teach as an educator, the thing that is so hard to sort of reconcile with as a professional is the value you bring to a business, you know, and this idea of value-based pricing, which is something I've never actually done, but I'm aware of it. You know, you're not billing hourly, you're not billing by project, you're billing by a percentage of what you bring to the bottom line of the business. I mean, ultimately, that's really, I think, the kind of conversation as far as design goes, you know, that, you know, what are you giving to the client? If, honestly, if a 10 or Fiverr logo gives value to the client, you can't necessarily say that's incorrect. Again, I don't like it and you don't like it. And most people probably listening to this don't like it, but you can't argue it's 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 bad or wrong. It's just a different way of going about it. And so I think that um, the thing with design that has always irritated me as a designer is this idea of like arrogant insecurity. You know, like like designers are we're so full of ourselves, but God forbid you you think about a Fiverr logo or you open up Microsoft Word for something, you know, like, you're, you know, you're, how are you disrespecting us? And so, I don't know, design, you know, the arts, it, it, it is in the arts. It always sits in this idea where people think it's sort of extra, like it's not necessary. You know, the arts are sort of a bonus. If you have extra money to deal with it, that's fine. And I, and, and I, I'm gonna grow. I'm not gonna quote him, but Ethan Hawke has the actor Ethan Hawke has this great idea of how the arts are actually the most valuable thing because they help us sort of understand our place in this in this existence as a human being, right? And and again, how you do that, I'm the wrong guy to talk to. Like I'm not the guy to ask how to do that. I'm really good at education, and I'm trying to get really good at you know this sort of arts practice, but yeah. the ins and outs of like business to business sort of stuff, I'm just not there. I just haven't done that in such a long time that I, I've always talking to people with a grain of salt. Like I have opinions, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a privileged white guy. Of course I have opinions. Right. But like, take what I have to say, you know, maybe a person who's out there hustling every day is really who you should be asking about, yeah. you know, the job yeah. stuff. Definitely. Yeah. So if you had a magic wand, yeah, would you do anything different in, in, in the way you teach or in, in changing? What, what would you change? Um, not nothing. And that does not mean, I want to clarify, not because I'm perfect. I am, so far from good in a lot of ways at this. Like I'm pretty good sometimes, but I think that for me, the mistakes, the stops and starts, the um, sort of life experience I had before becoming a designer, you know, all of that stuff, all of those years where I was kind of just like punching the clock at a retail job, I think it all counts. Sure, no, no. I, I wouldn't in the way, be where in I the am way, without that. Yeah. In the way you currently deliver education, in your exactly. current environment. Absolutely. Would, would you change anything? Yeah. I mean, not, not specifically. I mean, would I change a specific day, how I said something stupid? Yeah, of course. Like, certainly I have many mistakes, but broadly speaking, no, I really think that, that, that the only part of education that kind of gets under my skin a little bit now that I would change. And, and I think a lot of this is sort of a post COVID sort of reaction. Um, COVID was such a horrible time to be an educator. And it was so difficult as everybody watching this is going to know that, you know, that's not news. But I feel like the students these days, and this is certainly not every student, but just broadly speaking, students feel very delicate right now. And like, they're still sort of getting over this hump. Like a lot of students I'm teaching graduated high school in COVID or right after COVID, they sort of did stuff on Zoom for their education. And so I feel like there's still this very, there. there's a lot of stressors and a lot of anxiety and a lot of additional stuff that is bubbling up that I maybe didn't experience when I was sort of where they were because I did not have the same experience. And so there's this tone of sort of um, keeping the students happy, which I understand why educators sort of say that, but that is not, our job is not customer service. Like we are not in the business of customer service. We are in the business of education. But at the same time, students are coming from such challenging environments. They're coming from all these different walks of life. You have no idea what a student's home life looks like. You have no idea what their financial situation is yeah. like. And it's really easy to be like, stop complaining, do it. But they might not be able to do it because they might have to take care of a sick parent or you know, they're, they're a single mom or any number of factors that we don't understand. But having said that, I, I think we have to get a back a little bit towards um, 
not toughening up because that's a stupid like macho thing to say, but sort of um, holding students, sort of raising the standard a little bit more every year. Um, I think understandably and justifiably the standard dropped a little bit during COVID. And I think that was a good thing because it was such a toxic reality for everybody. But now I think we kind of have to bring it back up a little bit. You know, I just feel like we got to hold the students to a little bit higher standards. I think we got to keep kind of raising the bar a little bit. We have to give them a lot more agency and a lot more accountability for their education. And that's a lot of what we're doing in this giant class that we're teaching as we're all these students to really strict standards. You know, we're available to them. We're, we're talking to them all the time, but we're really making them kind of hit higher levels of expectation. And so it's not really a complaint. It's more just an observation. That's what I think needs to change. So beyond that, I mean, I, I love what I'm doing, but I do feel like this is a chance to start re just raising the bar a little bit overall. And that's not just like with freshmen, that's with kind of all students in general. Um, schools are closing left and right. I mean, it's, it's, it's awful. I know colleagues who got to, who lose in their jobs. I mean, it's, it's just, it's awful. And college is really expensive. Like no kidding, right? It's super expensive. It's like a four or a five or whatever year commitment out of your life. A lot of students, whether they're 18, 19, 20, don't necessarily know what they really want to do when they're in their 40s. And so it's kind of a bet. You know, a student comes to college, it's a very expensive bet that they're taking on themselves or their parents are sometimes forcing on them. And I think we've got to not deliver value like, you know, a Walmart delivers value, but deliver something that they're getting out of this experience versus, oh, I guess that's just what I'll do is go to college. Like, I guess that's my next thing. I do. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. not good for anybody, especially. But, that, but that requires what you said to deliver value requires the accountability. Exactly. And that's the game that it's, I'm playing is like how, and again, I am just, I don't know what people think of me online. I am not an asshole. Like I'm a really nice person. Like I really don't like conflict or yelling at people, but like part of me wants to be like, stop screwing around and just like get to it. Like, why are you wasting my time and your time right now? Do, you know, and again, it isn't about money, but you can kind of say to a student, do you know how many hundreds of dollars today's class cost you? Like literally cost you? Like just to like, uh, let's put it into sort of like, you know, a quantitative amount. Like, what are you doing here, dude? Like, why, you know, if you don't need to be here, go earn a lot more money out in the world. You don't need to waste everybody's time here, you know? I try to say to them about the luxury of talking about design. Exactly. You know, other kids are in different situations, much tougher. And this is like we're having this luxury of being able to talk about it. Our exactly. It is a, again, it's a privilege. It's a incredibly, incredibly unique experience that, and I can tell them from experience, like you're going to miss this when you graduate. You might hate today. I might be irritating you today, but you're going to miss the reality of this 10 years from now. You're going to wish you had this. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us more about your book. Do a shameless plug about your book. Oh, the shameless book. You mean this book sitting right here? <laughs> by my, uh, this, this no, I've, I've read it, but tell, tell, tell our audience about, uh, about your book. Yeah, so the book is called How to Be a Design Student and How to Teach Them. And it's really me in a very direct, not like academic-y, floofy way, just in a really truthful way, talking to students and talking to teachers about the design school experience. And really I use design school as a shortcut for art, design, creativity. I think it applies to like creative writing. I think it applies to almost anything, but I'm sort of narrowing it in the terms of design. And the idea is that school is really complicated. There's a million different things happening. If you're 18, 19, 20, you're just becoming a human being. In a lot of ways, your brain is still mushy. So there's all this like social pressure. There's all this like anxiety. There's like academic pressure. There's like you're, you're sleeping next to a stranger in a dorm room for the first time in your life. Like it is a weird, weird, very high pressure reality. Um, and a lot of students, you know, we as teachers and professionals forget how much work school is. Like these students are doing three or four projects at one time for three or four different people every like three weeks. Like it's insane. Like you don't do that in commercial practice, you know? And so the book is trying, well, maybe some people do. <laughs> the book is trying to have students who are currently in school, have students who are thinking about going to school or are unsure about school, um, teachers who are maybe, you know, feeling a little stagnated in their teaching or in their pedagogy, people who are thinking about teaching, um, any of the people sort of in and around school, like, like what really happens? And, and, and not that I am correct or wrong about any of this. It's all obviously an opinion, but my sort of take on what I found was really interesting in school and what I got out of it. And so that's what the book is about. It's it's really not a how-to. It's not a step-by-step -step book. It's not going to teach you about, you know, 
kerning type or anything like that. Yeah. But it's really more of just like a kind of a, a meta approach, both from the spa- standpoint of a student and from the standpoint of a faculty, because I argue in like the first chapter or second chapter, like we are not really that different. We are basically the same people. One is in a slightly different position than the other, but really we're on this kind of same team of learning. And I think any good educator is is in their own school sort of all the time. You know, they're always learning. They're not Absolutely. Like, I got it. Like, I'm done. I figured it out. And so that's really what the book is. And, and you know, I, I intentionally made it as affordable as I could. You know, it's not an expensive book. Um, and people are reading it. And I'm getting some amazing feedback. Like, it's kind of incredible that, like, I got to write this thing. Um yeah, it's been out for a little more than a year now, but, and, and it's you know books take a little time to get some traction, and it's starting. People are, it seems like people are reading it and, and are finding it useful. So that's, I don't care if they love it or not. If they found it even one thing useful, I'm I'm good. Like I'm delighted if people found anything in there useful. Where can our viewers and listeners find you? Uh, so mostly these days on Instagram. Um, at M Goldst, M G O L D S T. So that's all of my solsters with that. But I'm really only on. Instagram and threads right now. Um, Twitter is dead and I, it, it, you know, my account is there, but I'm never posting there again. Um, and, um, you know, MitchGoldstein.com is my website, but again, really on social, like, like I'm not, I'm on social. I'm always posting work. I'm posting my, my Mitchness, right? My, just my meanness on there, you know? Um, so yeah, that's probably the best place to find me is on social media. Wonderful. And tell us a uh, piece of advice you'd like to leave us with. Advice I'd like to leave you with. I think that all, I mean, all of my advice comes down to this. So this is like the, the meta advice, which is just be who you are. Um, I really think, especially with social media, especially with the internet, especially with sort of hero worship and, and curated sort of lives being thrust upon you on the internet and things like that. It's really easy, especially for a younger person to be like, oh, I guess that's what I need to do. Like, I got to be like that person or I see this designer and I got to be like that designer. No. We, that designer is good. We got that designer. We're covered with that designer. You need to be who you are. And so ultimately my advice, and it's really easy to say it and really hard to do it, is to be you and to make decisions that are good for you. Not make decisions you think somebody else would tell you to do, right? Not put work in your portfolio you think somebody else might really be excited about. What are you excited about? And Again, it sounds really easy for me to sit back here on a podcast and kind of say that, and it's really hard to execute. That's extremely, it's a challenge. I, have a, I struggle with it every day. But honestly, that's the only advice that matters, I think, is be who you are. Try to be truthful to yourself. Yes, pay your bills, you know, cover your bases, you know, do what you got to do to make a living, but ultimately be yourself. And that's, that's it. Like, that's the advice. And if you figure out how to do it, let me know. Because I wonderful, 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 wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, keep in touch with the podcast. Uh, it's fantastic to have this conversation with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. It was great.